So I think people are still beeping in, but we'll go ahead and start. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I am Julie Robinson. I'm a professor in the Center on Aging at UConn Health and am very pleased to introduce our speaker today, who is a colleague of mine. Um, so I'm going to just give you a some brief background about Dr. Carr, and then she will go ahead with her presentation. Um, Deborah Carr is professor and chair of the Department of Sociology at Boston University. And previously, she was professor and chair of the Sociology Department at Rutgers University, where she also served as the interim director of the Institute for Health, Healthcare Policy, and Aging Research. Dr. Carr's research explores social factors affecting health over the life course, and she focuses in three main areas. First, family relationships over the life course and implications of those relationships for later life, physical, emotional, as well as economic well-being. Second, end of life issues and bereavement. And third, the psychosocial impacts of stigmatized identities, including obesity and disability, which is the focus of her talk today. She has published more than 120 peer-reviewed articles and chapters and is the author or editor of nine books. Her latest book, which is called Golden Years, Social Inequality in Later Life, published in 2019, received the 2020 Kalish Innovative Publication Award from the Gerontological Society of America. She is the co-editor of the forthcoming Handbook of Aging and the Social Sciences, uh, the, the ninth edition of that volume. Further, Dr. Carr is editor-in-chief of the Journal of Gerontology Social Sciences, which is one of the flagship journals of the Gerontological Society of America. She is the principal investigator of the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, 1979, and a co-investigator of the MIDAS study, which is the Midlife in the United States Survey. She's also an advisor to other NIH and NSF-funded surveys focused on health and aging. Dr. Carr serves on the board of directors of the Population Association of America. She's a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America, and she recently completed a five-year term on the NIH Social Sciences and Population Studies study section. So we are very pleased that Dr. Carr is here today with us to present her research, and I will turn it over to you, Debbie. Great. Well, thank you, Julie, for your kind introduction, and thank you, everybody, for showing up today to this WebEx presentation. I'm keeping fingers crossed that technology is on our side. Um, I look forward to sharing um, some of my new research with you, and I especially look forward to the Q&A that we'll have at the end of our session. Here we go. Great. Um, so as Julie mentioned, today I'll be discussing the topic of interpersonal and institutional discrimination among U.S. adults with disability. And I'll be summarizing a couple of different papers and projects that are based on the MIDAS study, which is a long-term survey of adults in the United States. And so there are three main questions that I'll be talking about today. Um, first, are people with disability at an elevated risk of interpersonal and inter institutional discrimination? Second, how do these patterns vary by life course stage? Uh, we know that disability is much more common in later life and less so in early life, which means there might be very different expectations for not only individuals, but those people with whom they work and interact. Um, so I'll be looking at those life course stage variations and exposure to different types of discrimination. Um, then I'll be moving from the population at large, specifically to workers, and I'll be asking whether workers with disability report uh, reduce workplace opportunities and less co-worker and supervisor support relative to those without disability. And again, I'll be looking at subgroup differences. Do these patterns vary by age, sex, and occupational category? And that'll be one of the themes of today's talk, that any identity, such as disability status or obesity, something I looked at in my other work, um, how one enacts that identity and how it's reacted to by others is very much shaped by social context, having to do with things like social class, age, and sex. So these are the questions that I'll be answering today. If anyone needs to leave early or if their internet dies, the answer to all of these questions is yes. But hopefully throughout the talk, I'll show you a, a bit more nuanced interpretation of the question and the data. And so just so we're all on the same page, um, um, when I talk about uh, institutional and interpersonal discrimination today, I just want to be clear that these are not 
formal discrimination complaints or EEOC cases, but rather people's perceptions. And as I go through the talk today, hopefully it will be clear why perceptions of mistreatment matter. Um, there's a large literature showing that mistreatment on the basis of any identity, whether it race or class or disability status or obesity, can take a toll on physical and mental health. And so that's one of the reasons why I think we're looking at perceptions of one's experiences are very important. Yet another reason is that it's only those individuals with actual social and economic power that have the wherewithal often to file an official discrimination complaint, for instance. Um, we know that those formal complaints are very rare, and there are daily and pernicious forms of discrimination, and mistreatment, and stigmatization that I believe are equally important. So I just put up for here for you to kind of give a quick view to the different subtypes of institutional and interpersonal discrimination that I'll be talking about today. Self-reported experiences of workplace discrimination, like not being hired, not be or being fired, for instance, due to a personal trait. Um, daily discrimination one might receive at the doctor's office or when one goes shopping, for instance. So different types of discrimination from service providers. Then I also look at interpersonal or daily discrimination, which we might think of as microaggressions. Do people treat you as if you're not smart, if you're not competent? So that's another set of perceived um, mistreatment that I'm looking at. And then halfway through the talk, I'll pivot from general uh, mistreatment to workplace specific mistreatment. And I'll be focusing on perceived job discrimination and perceived blocked opportunities in the workplace, as well as interpersonal relationships with supervisors and coworkers. But again, there are a whole realm of different workplace experiences I could look at for those persons with disability who are employed. And I chose to focus on these two because we know from the general literature, two of the main reasons why someone leaves the job they're currently in are either one, they feel there's nowhere to go. They feel that their mobility prospects are blocked. So that speaks to those first two, kind of getting ahead in the workplace, but then also getting along the quality of our relationships in the workplace. And if they are subpar, that's another leading factor why people change work. And given that people with disability have lower rates of employment to start with, I think it's important to look at those factors of workplace employment that might be a direct source of discomfort or distress, but that also may trigger their, their departures from the workforce, which forces them again to seek new employment, which we know is often a difficult experience that has obstacles. So that's a brief overview of the kinds of outcomes that I'll be looking at in today's talk. So just to give a little bit of background about disability, I know we have lots of experts in the audience, so I'll be fairly brief here. Um, but disability is a very large category. There's a lot of theoretical writings on what exactly disability encompasses. And today I'll be focusing on it from this angle, that disability is really any restriction or difficulty carrying out daily tasks. In the talk today, I won't be looking at specific conditions that underlie disability, such as a hearing impairment or lower body impairment specifically, but really looking at the obstacles in performing daily activities. So that's how disability will be um, operationalized in the study today. And there are a lot of reasons to care about disability and especially disability over the life course. Um, we know that the rates of disability increase with age, um, but we also know that rates are increasing for younger people, right? The number of young adults who are classified as idle by the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics has been increasing, meaning the number of young people who are neither in school or at work. And one of the leading reasons why some young people are not engaged in those two main activities is because they do have some underlying health condition that um, is associated with disability. Um, we know that formal institutional discrimination against people with disability is prohibited by law, dating back to the American Disabilities Act, which turns 30 this year. But like I mentioned earlier, um, the number of uh, discrimination cases that actually go through the levels and, and are uh, filed with EEOC is relatively rare, yet there are these daily harmful forms of mistreatment that are not covered under that legislation that are important for economic well-being, psychological and physical well-being. So I think that's part of the why should we care. Um, but another reason that we should care is that persons with disability are far less likely than those without to be currently employed. Right? The, the gaps are, are quite telling. Um, persons without disability have labor force participation rates about twice that of persons without. 
Um, so we know that a person with disability is far less likely to work at all, right? And so it's important to look at for those who are working, what are their experiences like? And here's just a, a quick chart to give you a sense of disability type, meaning this is the proportion of persons with disability who are in the labor force. And as you can see, it really varies dramatically based on what the underlying condition is. And in today's talk, I am not parsing um, my category of dis persons with disability by the specific type of impairment, but this just gives you a sense that there really is a range. So really the heart of my talk or the theoretical underpinnings of my talk draw on stigma theory, also a topic that I know many of you have tremendous expertise in. And this is a, a conceptual framework going back to uh, Goffman. And as we know, stigma is, is a phenomenon whereby some personal trait is discredited by others. And people who possess that trait often are disqualified from full social acceptance. And I think disability in particular is a, is a stigmatized trait in Western wealthy capitalist nations because being able-bodied is viewed as a marker of competence and vigor, or capacity to work. And so deviations from that might be viewed as a characterological blemish if someone is not doing that which is expected of them. So be that as it may, I think we can presume that some identities like having a disability um, is something that's stigmatized, but a theme of today's talk today is that stigma does not happen equally for all people in all contexts. And I'll give just kind of a quick uh, theoretical overview before digging into the data. You know, disability by definition impairs our abilities to act in necessary, usual, and expected ways. And we know that expectations for how one should act and what one can do vary by things like age and like gender. And so that's one of the motivations for why in today's talk, I'll be looking to see whether disability interacts with age, sex, and occupational group, and to see whether that modifies the effect of disability on one's treatment in the workplace, as well as one's interpersonal exchanges um, more generally. And in the discussion, uh, in the interest of time, I can talk a little bit more about why we would expect disability to have far less of an effect for older people. Some of the main explanations are that it is statistically more normative and older adults tend not to perceive negative exchanges with the same intensity as to, to the extent that younger people do. So there are a range of both statistical and kind of psychological reasons why we presume that disability would be experienced very differently for older people versus midlife versus younger. Um, but also I think there are some other factors and other theories that help us to think about why it is that disability might intersect with other social identities to either amplify or mute its effect. And so when I talk about my workplace outcomes specifically, um, the main emphasis for that part of the analysis today is whether female workers versus male workers, older versus younger, and then workers who are white collar versus blue collar, whether those persons with disability experience the workplace differently. And there are a variety of theoretical models that met, might help us to think about that. On one hand, if we believe the master status uh, literature, we might think that disability matters equally for all people. Disability overshadows all other identities. If we're coming from a multi -jeopardy, multiple jeopardy perspective or an intersectionality perspective, we might think that other identities that historically have less social power or economic power might amplify the effects, such as women with disability might have a more difficult time in the labor market than men, because it sits at that intersection of ableism and sexism. But then we might think even further, there might be these kind of surprising effects that groups that historically have been disadvantaged might actually have a buffer against disability. And this is a hypothesis, it's a little counterintuitive, but there are some interesting literatures that suggest that people of lower socioeconomic status, for instance, um, a category that we know is uh, one that brings less social and economic power, we know that disability is more common among blue collar workers or people with lower levels of education, just given what we know about the gradient in health, for instance. And so we might think that those people with less economic power, for instance, might stigmatize less. So lower status workers might find less stigmatization and mistreatment relative to those in more prestigious jobs, just given the fact that uh, disability is, is less common among those with higher status jobs. So that's kind of the setup for the theory. I'm going through fairly quickly, but then we can revisit it when we get to the Q&A. 
But I think the literature suggests because some interesting puzzles, right? We might think that being female, being a lower status worker, for instance, might amplify the effects of disability on workplace mistreatments and opportunities, but there were also some suggestions that the effects might be uh, the other way, that actually someone who belongs to a group with less social or economic power might be buffered for a range of reasons. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more in the conclusion. So the data that I'll be talking about today are from the MIDAS, which is the National Survey of Midlife Development in the United States. Um, this is a national random sample survey of people born between 1920 and 1970. Um, it's a phone interview and then a mail back questionnaire. And in the analysis that I'll be showing you today, I'll, I'll be focusing on two different samples. The first is the overall sample. And then the second that focuses on the workplace is focusing on those who are currently working. Um, we can talk about kind of methodological details later, but um, other issues, item specific missing data is really rare. Um, so I used mice to impute missing data for all the covariates. So getting back to the focal predictor, um, what is disability status in my analysis? Uh, hearkening back to the uh, definition I gave earlier, not the underlying physical condition, but rather it is the ways that one's behavior is affected. So it's an indicator of how much one's health limits oneself in engaging in a variety of activities like lifting, walking upstairs, walking around the block, et cetera. Um, I use a pretty coarse, broad measure here, just as someone's classified as having disability if they indicate some difficulty on any of the nine. Um, I've tried a bunch of other different specifications, a more uh, restrained cut, for instance, those who have a lot of difficulty, continuous measures and uh, uh, quadratic measures. But in the model fit, this general measure um, was the one that yielded the greatest model fit. Um, the other practical reasons that once we start doing moderation analyses, I need adequate sample size to have, for instance, an adequate number of young people with disabilities. So that's why it's a fairly broad cut. But the results don't actually change that dramatically if I use a more restrictive definition of disability. Um, here, just a little bit more details on the different outcomes that I'm looking at, workplace discrimination, service discrimination, and then these perceived interpersonal discrimination, which is how often on a day-to-day -day basis do we experience some of these specific types of mistreatment. Um, these, again, are perceived, whether you're treated with less respect, less courtesy, for instance, that's the respect outcome. Then hearkening back to the language of Goffman about characterological flaws, something called blemish of character, which is someone is treated as if they're not honest or they're frightening. And then a more severe form, such as being insulted or threatened or harassed. So these are the different types of interpersonal discrimination. Then as far as the workplace experiences, it's that workplace support from both coworkers and supervisors. And I look at these separately for a variety of reasons, but a worker's relationship with coworkers and supervisors tends to be quite different. Coworkers are peers, they're a source of social support, where a supervisor also is the one who can advocate for a worker with disability and can help them get support or information. So I look at those separately. Um, and then two other aspects of workplace experience. One is whether one feels that they are discriminated against in terms of being given poorer quality jobs, being um, ignored, not receiving a promotion at the same pace your coworkers do. So again, experiences of discriminatory treatment. And then the last one is a subscale that was made for the Midas called perceived inequality at work. And this really speaks to this issue of getting ahead, knowing that one of the main reasons people leave their job is that they perceive that there's no um, opportunity to get ahead. That's what this, this scale captures, things like feeling that other people are more likely to get, have rewarding jobs, the feeling that one doesn't have opportunities for advancement, et cetera. So it's kind of a broad collection of measures but I think that's important to show kind of the multifaceted ways that um, disability can affect one's everyday life through these potentially stigmatizing experiences. Then the moderators I talked about and uh, addressing this question of for whom is disability a source of discrimination and stigmatization. Uh, one part of the analysis looks at age slash cohort. I look at young adulthood, early midlife, late midlife, and later life in the overall um, study. Um, in the study 
that focus just on current workers. I do not include those over age 65 because that's an atypical worker um, given retirement patterns. And I also look at sex and major occupation. So this is a very coarse cut again, but upper white collar workers tend to be professionals like professors or doctors. Lower white collar is service work like administrative assistance, secretarial work, and then blue collar encompasses manual work such as um, a truck driver, construction, and agricultural work. Um, the covariates are kind of the usual suspects. Um, uh, these are factors that may be confounded with both risk of uh, disability, but also other forms of mistreatment. So gender, race, and marital status, socioeconomic status. Then I do control for 27 underlying health conditions, as well as mental health, including presence of a major mental health disorder and negative affect, um, both because those are characteristics and might shape how it is that one perceives their world, but also we know there are high rates of discrimination against persons with mental health conditions. So those are controlled in the analysis. But now we can get to kind of the good stuff, the results. Um, so here are the answers to the questions. So, are people with disability at an elevated risk of interpersonal and institutional discrimination? This is a really clear answer, yes, they are, for all of the outcomes that I told you about, even net of their physical health and underlying mental health conditions. So here, a lot of numbers going on, but there are just a couple things to follow with your eyes. Here, these are regression uh, results, predicting lack of respect, whether you're treated as if you're a poor character, and then whether you have been harassed or insulted. And one thing you can see here is for those people who are classified as having disability, there is a significant effect across models. We can see that the effect attenuates here um, as, we, as I add in each block of covariates. But even in this final model here where we control for physical health and mental health, we still see a statistically significant effect of disability on each of the three um, dimensions of interpersonal discrimination. It's a small effect, but it is a statistically significant effect. So those are for the interpersonal discrimination. The next here, these are the institutional discrimination outcomes, whether you experienced workplace discrimination, and whether you experienced service discrimination. This is logistic regression. And as you can see, there's a significant positive effect of disability on the odds of being not hired or fired due to uh, a personal condition. Again, they're about 40% more likely in the final uh, model, and likewise for service discrimination. So net of all controls, persons with disability are about 40% as likely as those without to experience workplace discrimination and service discrimination. So that's overall. But now when we dig a little bit more deeply, do these patterns look the same over the life course? And the answer is no. These are the moderation analyses looking to see whether the impact of disability on those various outcomes you just saw differs based on one's life course stage. And the results showed statistically significant interaction effects such that the effect of disability on this particular outcome I'm showing you of being treated disrespectfully, not statistically significant for young adults, and not statistically significant at older ages, but for midlife people, there was a large and significant effect. So there are a couple of ways to look at this. Overall, as people are age, if you see this line going downward, with each year of age, people become less likely to report that they've been treated disrespectfully. But regardless of one's age, those reports of disrespect are always higher for those who have disability, that thick black line up top, and the gap between those two groups, those with versus without disability, is significantly larger at early midlife and slightly uh, smaller, but still statistically significant at late midlife. And I'm showing you a couple examples of outcomes, but very similar patterns occurred across the different outcomes that I've told you about. So this is for disrespectful treatment. Very similar pattern for institutional discrimination, such as being treated poorly by service providers, such as doctors. And so it's clear that in early and late midlife, when rates of disability are modest, but certainly not to the high level they are among older adults, that is the age at which individuals with disability are treated the most harshly by their coworkers, by service providers, and so on. Um, 
in the discussion, I'll talk a little bit more about why I don't think we see a significant effect in young adulthood. It looks like a big gap. It's not statistically significant. I think that reflects a cohort-based phenomena where younger adults um, have entered the labor market and went through school post-ADA. They are more able to um, ask for accommodation. They might have a greater level of comfort. So I think there are some age and cohort patterns going on um, as we think about why it is that disability will lead to a very different daily life experience for young people, early midlife, later midlife, and then older adults. So now uh, we can move on to the next question. Um, do employed people, again, these are people just who are working with disability report constrained opportunities for advancement at work and then uh, reduce coworker and supervisor support? And again, patterns start to look very similar to what we just heard that yes, there are these significant overall patterns and they persist net of all controls. So I'll throw up a couple of models here for you. Again, just as you saw earlier, uh, the coefficient on disability for experiences of perceived job discrimination and then perceived inequality. Again, that label for I don't have a chance to get ahead in my workplace. It's a statistically significant effect. It attenuates a bit once we control for in the final model underlying mental health and physical health. It's still a statistically significant effect. And then likewise, similar patterns for support from coworkers and support from supervisors. So that suggests, yes, the overall patterns suggest that disability compromises multiple aspects of workplace experiences. But now we're gonna dig a little bit deeper and ask that question of for whom, for whom is this more or less um, problematic? And so do these patterns that I just showed you differ by social location? And the answer is yes, but in counterintuitive ways. And so what I find is that persons with disability from groups that we might think of as um, historically privileged are the ones who actually report poorer workplace experiences. And like most people, when we have counterintuitive results, we think we coded something wrong. So I checked my code a million times and tried different sensitivity analyses, and these results still persisted. So hopefully we can kind of reason through together, drawing on theory, um, and drawing on theories of intersectionality and ultimately theories of masculinity as to why some of these counterintuitive findings emerge. So first, this question of people with disability, if you look at uh, persons with disability, how do they perceive their levels of support from coworkers specifically? And here I find a significant moderation effect, but we see one group is actually doing the poorest, and this is upper white collar workers. Again, it's those professionals, it's those professors, as opposed to those factory workers. And this is the one statistically significant difference. All these other bars are pretty much the same, but this one here is significantly lower. So if you are a professional worker with disability, you report significantly lower levels of support from coworkers relative to all the other subgroups. And um, one explanation, again, I have for that is just, it's statistically less typical knowing what we know about health disparities, but we also might think about what Goffman talks about as wise persons, right? If you might live in a community where your friends or family members have a particular condition, that's gonna be more likely in blue collar and lower white collar communities, right? So if you are the kind of person who has other members of your community with a particular trait such as disability, you will be less likely to stigmatize it. For upper white collar workers for whom disability is rare, um, they might have just far fewer encounters either with own or others. And that may be part of the reason why coworkers are less accepting of and less supportive of their colleagues who have disability. So that's one counterintuitive finding. Next, this was one that I found interesting and puzzling at first, but then when I stepped back, it seemed like it was consistent with some writings on masculinity and gender differences in the workplace. So this is looking at gender differences. And again, I'm showing just a couple of exemplars given all the outcomes, but I expected that women with disability might have greater obstacles in the labor market, sitting at that intersection of sexism and ableism. And what instead the data show is that it's men with disability or the ones who perceive the greatest obstacles to getting ahead. And again, this is a statistically significant interaction term. This one black bar here with the blue arrow on top of it is significantly higher than all the other bars. And again, one explanation I have for why is it that men 
um, with disability in particular are the ones who are most aggrieved about what they perceive to be their opportunities for getting ahead. It might speak to the issue of uh, this notion of the ideal male worker. Men are more likely than women across the board to perceive that they have greater chances of getting ahead. They also have greater expectations for their capacities to get ahead. So to the extent that a, a man um, feels that he has fewer options, um, again, especially a man with disability for whom that threat to masculinity may be particularly acute, that might be one explanation for why we see the significant difference for men, and, but not for women. Then uh, finally, one last slide I will give you before uh, going into the wrap up. Um, here, this is the age differences. So you remember earlier from um, the general uh, discrimination analysis, it looked like um, people who were midlife workers, with midlife individuals reported more discrimination than older or younger people. Here, we find something a little bit different. So this is the outcome of support from your supervisor. And there's one bar significantly higher than all the others. So young adults report significantly more support from their supervisor relative to other workers. And again, I think that might reflect a, a cohort-based phenomenon where younger adults feel more empowered to disclose their underlying condition to their supervisor. They may have gone through school or through um, early work experiences, feeling more comfortable disclosing. Another possible explanation and something we're going to dig into in future studies is it could be that young adults with disability have had that condition since much earlier in life. It might be something that they've adapted to, something that they've accepted, and that might be a very different beast of what disability looks like relative to midlife or late, early or late midlife people for whom the disability might come from a later onset condition that they haven't yet adapted to. And I think it generates lots of ideas when we think about the way that disability shapes our lives on a daily basis at different life course stages and across different birth cohorts who enter the labor market during a very different point in history um, in terms of uh, how common accommodations are and legal support um, for workers with disability. So those are a few of the main findings. I'm happy to kind of talk at, at greater depth in the Q&A about others. Um, so just to wrap up here in the next uh, seven minutes before the Q&A start, um, the results overall show that disability is a powerful predictor of multiple forms of institutional and interpersonal discrimination and interpersonal and structural or perceived structural aspects of workplace experiences. The effects do attenuate weight net of socioeconomic status and race and gender and underlying physical and mental health conditions, but they still persist. Um, so that's one finding. But then when we crack into the data a little bit more, we see that the experiences play out very differently based on age and gender and occupational group. So one of the first findings, again, I, I showed you is that uh, disability matters very differently based on one's age group. And I think there are a couple reasons. One is that, again, it's far less statistically normative. The other is that we know that older adults and younger adults, even if they're presented with the same stressor or the same difficult interpersonal exchange, older adults are less likely to attend to it, to acknowledge it. And it doesn't mean they feel it any less necessarily, but they just have a different way of perceiving those kinds of experiences. Um, I think this is it, uh, an interesting finding because it does have implications for um, other outcomes such as physical or mental health. And I'm just gonna show one slide from another paper that, that builds on this results a little bit more. So we find not only that older adults don't necessarily report discrimination, but in the subsequent analysis, when I look to see the extent to which discrimination may be a mechanism linking disability to depression, I actually find that for older adults, it's not a mechanism. You know, this is a little tricky to follow, so I'll show you one slide here. In a related study, I asked the question of, does the effect of disability on depressive symptoms operate through discrimination, right? Discrimination may be a secondary stressor through which disability affects mental health. And what we found is that while discrimination is a mediator, it is a pathway 
for people with disability at the middle age groups here, you see those lines, it's not so for older adults. So this suggests to us, again, there are differences by age group and how disability is experienced. And even though disability may be linked with depressive symptoms for people of all age groups, discrimination isn't the mechanism accounting for it for older adults. So there are other aspects of the way that disability affects everyday life for older people that is the mechanism that links it to mental health. Whereas for younger people, discrimination is a pretty powerful mechanism linking, again, the disability with depression. So then this just kind of raises this uh, mission for all of us to figure out if there is some mechanism here, it may indeed be different by life or stage. We need to think in kind of creative ways when we run our mediation analysis to figure out what is the engine driving that association. Um, just a couple of other results to recap here. Um, Again, I think one clear finding that came through is that disability plays out differently based on the expectations of the person with the disability, as well as the expectations and perceptions of those people with whom they interact. Again, that effect for men, but not women, might ex reflect their expectations for themselves in the workplace, but also the expectations that their colleagues have for them. And that might be one of the reasons why men with disability perceive that they have fewer op opportunities to get ahead. It could hinge really more on the expectations of their boss and coworkers or what they perceive a male worker should be. Then finally, the result for younger cohorts, um, it could reflect, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that these younger cohorts did enter the labor market post-1990. So throughout their lives, they might have received more responsive accommodations, might feel more comfortable, might feel more comfortable Kind of advocating for themselves. So those are some of the main findings. Let's get that for now. So just in terms of the implications, well, what do we do with all these many results that I have just uh, thrown at you today? Well, I think it does force us to think about sites of intervention. Um, that yes, there is the ADA, and yes, the ADA prevents discrimination regarding hiring and firing, but the results I showed you, showed you today suggests that there's something about what's happening in the workplace and then what's happening among service providers and social institutions and those individuals they serve, which calls for just a variety of workplace interventions or training programs, such as incorporating things like implicit bias training, training about invisible, uh, invisible disabilities, um, training and things like disclosure and accommodation, as well as active recruitment of workers with disability to again, fight ableism. I think another takeaway is that oftentimes disability is thought of as a master status, a trait that defines a worker. And I think the multiple uh, moderation analyses I've presented to you today do demonstrate that overlapping identities must be considered and they often overlap in kind of puzzling ways. And so although workers with disability uh, require accommodations, I think in terms of workplace training and how supervisors interact with their workers, they need to consider other aspects of the individual having to do with one, one's own perceptions and expectations for how those workers might be treated. I'll just in my last slide here, talk about future directions um, I suspect some people are thinking, well, where were the race interactions? If you're talking about double jeopardy or intersectionality, race, of course, should be part of the conversation. And if you're thinking that, you are absolutely right. Um, the MIDAS data that I described for you today does not have, in my mind, adequate numbers of African Americans to do the sophisticated moderation analyses, but we do have a MIDAS Milwaukee oversample that will be part of future work. Also, one other thing I'm gonna dig into more is ONET data, looking to see whether the ways that disability plays out in the labor market differs based on the tasks that are part of one's everyday work. And this is something we can get from ONET data. Um, but also moving forward, looking at that intersection with underlying conditions, whether they're visible or invisible. And then finally, um, for the MIDAS, like a lot of surveys, we are applying for funding for our next wave of data now, which would happen after kind of post-COVID. It would happen in another year or so. And I think there's certainly conversation about the extent to which the stigma associated with disability and poorer health in general might intensify in the post-COVID era. So I think that additional wave of data will allow for some really interesting overtime analyses. So that was kind of a whirlwind tour through some of my new work. 
Um, thank you to NIH for funding the MIDAS and for my former postdoc for doing terrific work on this project. And so thank you, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carr. That was really fascinating. Um, raised a lot of questions. Uh, this is Debbie Kornman. I'm the Associate Director of INSHIP. Um, I want to give people the opportunity to ask questions, um, a lot of provocative findings. Uh, I ask you to please um, raise your hand and we will unmute you. You can look for the little hand next to your name and uh, you can ask questions. So please feel free. Um, Debbie, one thing that I was um, curious about is, um, is there any data on sort of internalized stigma and that the role that that plays in some of these possible findings? Not particularly, no. I mean, there are questions about one's attribution for why it is they perceive they have been mistreated, um, but there isn't anything about um, what you're getting at. And I think it would be something like, to what do they attribute that mistreatment? Is it yes. about themselves? And this is, I think, one of the limitations with these standard measures. Are you treated poorly at work because of something about you? Or because your boss is a jerk, or your coworkers are narrow-minded, um, and so those kind of deeper questions, no, we don't have. One thing I've looked at in other work is kind of breaking it down by to what one attributes the, sti the stigmatization, meaning which personal trait, or whether it's more than one. Um, and it, the results are generally the same whether you do the analysis with, with discrimination in general as opposed to discrimination attributed to a trait such as weight-related discrimination, body-related discrimination, but doesn't have that kind of fine-grained interpretation that one would hope for. Um, I'm going, I think I will unmute so, everyone. Oh, go ahead. Did someone have a question? Well, so this is Julie Robinson. I, I have a question, but I do see some other hands up too in the oh, right list. there. Yep. Go ahead, yeah. Julie. Go ahead, Julie. Yeah, um, Debbie, I'm wondering about cohort effects. So you can see the differences between the young adults, the mid midlife and the older adults. And um, this may be even more uh, feasible once you get a new cohort um, oh, there we go. in the future. But I don't, I wonder if um, as people kind of move from being a younger adult to a midlife adult or being a midlife adult to an older adult, if you, um, your, your two waves are just about 10 years apart. So they're probably not far enough apart, but do you expect that you'll see what do you think might, maybe if you just had to project, what do you think you might see as people sort of change? Is it is it a cohort effect or is it an age effect that you're seeing those differences? I actually think it's both. And we've done we've done a lot more analysis using kind of the, the two waves, initial waves of Midas. And then we have something called the refresher cohort. So we have only one wave of them, but they are younger. And we do find that for each wave, the midlife, People, whether it's the young or older midlife across the cohorts, they are significantly more likely than the older adults specifically to report that intensified uh, discrimination and to report greater depression in response to it. Um, but on the younger end, right, I think that is cohort specific. And I think what'll actually the perceived benefits, for instance, that we saw among the younger people for the um, supervisor, I expect that will remain the same if not intensify. So I think the midlife versus older is age specific, just given the statistical normativeness of disability. But for the young people, it's more of a cohort effect that I expect will actually intensify for the future cohorts coming through on the younger end in our future refresher cohorts. Oh, good. I hope that's true. <laughs> we do too. You know, we want to hope. Again, especially as it becomes both statistically more normative, the destigmatization certainly of mental health conditions like depression and anxiety among the younger cohorts and their willingness to kind of speak out publicly about everything from again, mental health conditions to mm -hmm. um, sensory conditions, for instance, which we're seeing more of the younger cohorts, gives me some optimism that, that yeah. I could improve continually. Thank you. Um, Debbie, Diane Quinn has a question. Diane, go ahead. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, well, such a great talk. Thank you so much for that. 
Um, I'm wondering, you just mentioned that you're going to collect some data after the pandemic, and um, it may have exacerbated some of the effects, but I'm wondering if it will attenuate some of the effects because since people are in their own homes, their disabilities might not be as visible or salient to other people. What do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. I should say we're not definitely getting the next wave of <laughs> on funding, so hopefully we will. Yeah, and I think it depends on how it's measured. And I think one thing I don't get into too much in this talk today, but I think if we have more constrained social ties and social relationships, we just have reduced exposure to outsiders, to put it coarsely. So that's another reason why older adults don't experience that much discrimination. Your social networks constrict in much the way that we're seeing for everybody today, right? So we might think to the extent that social networks constrict, there will be less mistreatment because you're always socializing with those who are less likely to judge you, with whom you have stronger ties, um, and with whom you have more regular contact. Um, so I think at some level it will diminish in terms of the interpersonal, but I think once we go back to kind of business as usual, there may be a greater stigmatization of those people with poor health, either because we view them as someone who is more likely to get ill, someone more likely to need a workplace accommodation or a labor market adjustment, as many of us are doing currently, right, under COVID. So um, again, I think it could go either way, um, but um, yeah, that's a great question. And I, and I hope you're right that we do see this diminution of mistreatment post COVID. Well, I hope you get your funding so we can find out. <laughs> oh, new wave of data is always good. Um, Mary, Mary Vecchio has a question. Hi, um, I was wondering if you had considered uh, outside factors that might um, that might have an effect on perception of discrimination, such as uh, especially in blue collar workers, things like consumers and um, say guests at a theme park, things like that. Uh, just for an, as, as an example, um, and how the actual consumer base treats uh, workers with disabilities and if that played a part at all. Yeah, that's a great question. And again, um, today I looked at kind of the, the, the job stratification only on work, but that's actually a great question. And I think one way to look at it is to look first at the individual level items and to see whether those people working in either blue collar jobs, as I looked at today, or stratifying it by particular industry, which we could do, right, the major census industries, whether the specific questions, uh, responses are different. And I suspect you're absolutely right. Things like treat you like you're not smart, for instance, treat you as if you are um, less competent. And that would be actually a great spinoff paper looking at, you know, uh, status differences in the, in the more micro. Um, you're right, because they wouldn't be the service provide, they wouldn't be treated that way by the provider. They may in fact be the provider being treated that way by the customer, right? Is that what you're asking about? Uh, yeah, uh, just from personal experience, when I worked at Disney, I didn't have an issue with um, uh, so much with the actual uh, workplace environment yeah. itself. It was yeah. a matter of when I was in the park, guests and their treatment of someone in a wheelchair was really the the issue yeah. um, that we had because people would just grab on to the handles of your your wheelchair and they would just push you around very suddenly without your consent. Um, and that like contributed to what I considered workplace harassment, but it wasn't from a source within the actual work, the work environment itself, like not a part of the structure, it was like someone outside of it. Yeah, and that actually would be really interesting. Strat and I think we have enough sample size to do that. Look either by particular industries, what are the levels, but what are the specific subtypes? And I know it's in the Midas, we have all these different measures, which are a source of frustration when I throw all these results at you, but it does help us to fine tune precisely how the mistreatment manifests itself in different social and economic contexts. So that's that's fantastic. That's an idea for a new paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have one uh, comment or question in the chat. Uh, just to confirm, while you looked only at disability in general, i.e. did not break down based on type or specific accommodation, need, or challenge. The data only collects information on physical dis disability, the parameters we saw listed, and not sensory or cognitive. Is that correct? Not sensory, but yes, cognitive, because we do have a large battery of, of cognitive functioning 
measures. And one thing I didn't show you today, I did break down across the disability groups by age, specifically which were the 27 conditions that were most and least common. And they really do vary pretty dramatically across the age groups. Whereas for younger people, they did tend to be more visible things. I mean, even things like dental problems and lower body. Whereas for older adults, it tended to be age-related health conditions like heart disease, for instance, and diabetes. Um, so we don't have the um, sensory, which is really too bad, but the cognitive we do. and. Um, Again, that's something that I could look at in a future study. And that's one of the things I want to do, kind of trying to stratify those that are more visible versus invisible and look to see the extent to which that moderates some of the patterns that we talked about today. Um, Diane, did you get your questions answered? I see your hand is still raised, but I thank you. Are you all set? Oh, yeah, I'm all set. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> um, well, I think you have uh, meetings coming up this afternoon, so I don't want to hold you any further. Um, I think there are people would love to talk to you further about this. It's really fascinating. Thank you so much, Debbie, for a really interesting presentation. Thank you so much. And if anyone has questions, just feel free to send an email. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.